So thank you. Um, thank you very much, Simon, and greetings to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here um, on International Women's Day. So ha happy, happy International Women's Day. Um, you know, the um, <laughs> slogan, the slogan of the UN Decade for Women, remember? Um, think globally, act locally. Um, head of politics of location built into it. Um, so it's worth remembering. Um, okay, so this um, conference so far has been exploring a specific question, but in the explorations of those questions, we've been registering a number of turns uh, that have um, occurred within the academy, within, within um, critical thought. Um, one is obviously the spatial turn. Um, another would be the turn to practice, um, certainly um, the turn to things and to objects um, has been very much in evidence and in the paper I want to give you today, the turn to technology and the turn to animals and the turn to reproduction um, figure um, prominently. Um, and some of this material is from a new book I've written about the history of in vitro fertilization, um, for which I've done a lot of work on the history of a specific technique, um, the technique of embryo transfer. Um, and it seemed a very fitting um, subject for this occasion because it's about moving embryos around um, and turning both embryos into tools and also turning their location into a means of exploiting those tools. So that's the subject of my talk. Can you hear me? I don't, I'm not using a mic. No, no. So can you hear me at the back? Am I reproducing yeah, myself yeah. adequately? Yeah. I should use the mic, okay. Would it be that, that one, the or, or should I use that one? No, the, big, the, tall, the tall bendy one. Okay, um, I'll have to move over here then. Okay, so um, that's probably better. Yeah, now I can hear myself. <laughs> um, this paper examines the location of knowledge in relation to bodies, and today I want to look at biological bodies um, in the simple sense of living bodies that are studied by biologists. But right away, um, push the down button. The down button. That's on not working. The, on the keyboard. Oh, on the keyboard. On the keyboard. Yes. Yes. And then the arrow. There you go. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're, uh, we're talking about living bodies are studied by biologists, but right away we encounter a conceptual issue that reminds us of the last session because the term biology confuses exactly the two kinds of knowledge that we're supposed to be separating for this conference, nam namely knowledge with and knowledge through. Confusingly, the term biology refers both to the object of study, specific biological bodies, as in the biology of the common ruminant, um, and the form of study, or the species of knowledge, as it were, referring to the discipline of biology or biological science. Biology conflates these two things, unlike sociology, which is, of course, the study of society. Um, this point has been made many times, and it's not of enormous interest in itself, but I can use it, nonetheless, um, as a basis for the hypothesis I'll explore today, which is that this conflation is progressive. And in particular, I want to suggest that one of the interesting things about the history of the technique I'll be discussing today, the history of embryo transfer, is that it allows us to explore how substantially biology has become technologized. So that in addition to conflating the object of study with the form of study, common uses of the terms biology and biological today increasingly conflate the means and ends of study as well as their objects and their forms. Um, and in my new book about the history of and future of in vitro fertilization and stem cell research, I suggest that IVF is not only a model of reproduction or for reproduction, it is not only both a copy of reproduction and a transformation of reproduction, it is also, of course, both a means and an end of reproduction, including, of course, human reproduction, <laughs> or um, as it's conventionally known biologically, reproduction in man. The rapid routinization of IVF over the past 30 years has, among other things, 
substantiated a new reproductive model as both biological and technological through which a new norm, including a new family norm, a new kinship norm, a new gender norm, a new norm of technologized biology has become standardized and humanized, not to mention routinized, commercialized, lots of other eyes. Another way to understand this transformation is to use precisely the terms that frame this event, namely what it means to move from an understanding that is formulated with something to how it is formulated through something and how these two locations of knowledge are related. The history of research on mammalian embryos that precedes in vitro fertilization exemplifies how an approach that begins by using embryos as study objects is transformed when these objects themselves become the means of study transforming classical or descriptive embryology into experimental embryology. And in turn, we can see how experimental embryology transforms over the course of the 20th century, eventually becoming not only a means of studying mammalian reproduction, but a means of accomplishing this end in humans. And as we now know, after 30 years of human IVF, after 5 million IVF offspring, the process of working with embryos has become a means of reproducing through embryos and this change from embryos as objects of study to in vitro embryos as means to a reproductive end has indeed been a transformative one. And to map this transformation I want to offer a very meandering tale that relates only a very small part of the human IVF story um, concerning the technique of embryo transfer in mammals which began more than a century ago here at Cambridge. Um, and since many other parts of the IVF story also happened here at Cambridge, this paper also implicitly asks and ends with what it means to study with and through Cambridge. Um, so I will return to that later. But for now, we need to imagine ourselves 110 years ago just north of Manchester in a small, private, experimental laboratory at the home of Walter Heap, a wealthy Victorian polymath with an interest in heredity. I want to use Heap's story to ask not only how mammalian embryos came to be moved around, moved through other animal bodies, instrumentalized and handled, um, but also how this knowledge is reproduced over time. Because Heap's experiments have become increasingly iconic um, within um, both the history of science and technology studies and increasingly the history of IVF. On April 27th, 1890, at his home in Presswich, not far from Oldham, where the world's first test tube baby would be born, just under a century later, the English experimental embryologist Walter Heap completed the first embryo transfer in a mammal by surgically removing a fertilized egg from an ang angora doe and transferring it into the uterus of a Belgian hare. The offspring of these experiments offered living proof of the viability of a new technique as well as partial confirmation of Heap's hypothesis that the maternal body exerted no transformational influence over the heritable components or germplasm mm -hmm. contained within the fertilized egg or conceptus. Heap had learned his highly innovative techniques at the morphological laboratory here in Cambridge, where he both trained and worked as a demonstrator under Michael Foster and Francis Belfer in the 1880s, and his description of rabbit embryo recovery was published as an appendix to Foster and Belfer's Elements of Embryology in 1883, and it was thus already part of the textbook embryology of the late 19th century, a period during which embryological experimentation was developing very rapidly. Although Heap would become a key figure in what was later denominated reproductive physiology, and known in particular for his research on reproductive seasonality, or estrus, his embryo transfer experiments concerned heredity rather than gestation. Um, like others before him and after him, Heap sought to prove that the mechanisms of heredity were completely independent from those of gestation. Um, oops, sorry, what was I had to do? But Heap, Heap had a larger animal in mind while he was working with his rabbits and hares, namely the infected <coughs> offspring of the agriculturist Lord Morton's prized thoroughbred mare, 
whose striped foal was the subject of a famous letter presented to the Royal Society as definitive proof of the ancient theory of telegony. In contrast to the argument prom promoted by Heap's contemporary, August Weissman, in 1893, that the germplasm conveys heritable particles or vital units intact, and that the apparatus for transmission of these, quote, nuclear rods existed completely independently of the body or of the soma, um, and were thus unalterable during the process of reproduction, telegonists, if we may call them that, believed in a form of reproductive imprinting. Uh, turns out they were kind of right, but that's another matter. Um, Weissman believed these views were outdated and unsound. Contrary to the opinions of Aristotle, Darwin, and the early modern English horse breeding community, the so-called Weissman barrier was imagined to separate heredity from reproduction completely. The continuity of the germplasm hypothesis divided the processes of germination from gestation just as completely as they divided one individual from another. The owners of the striped foals, born of very expensive thoroughbred mares, disagreed and would not be moved, and Lord Morton's mare proved their point. The question was clearly one of practical, as well as basic scientific interest, as so many agricultural questions often are. In a series of papers read to the Royal Society, which funded his work, Heap described the outcome of his embryo transfer experiments as a success, both in terms of producing viable offspring and confirming the absence of telegony. Proving the non-existence of a biological phenomenon, however, is difficult. The final disproof of the telegony theory awaited the horse and zebra experiments <coughs> of um, the Scottish zoologist James Ewart, um, shown here. Um, with one of his unusual experimental offspring, um, the Zorse. Um, and this is a very common technique in developmental biology to use the outside of the animal as a kind of map of the inside of the animal. It's still done all the time with mice um, reading their coat color. Um, and, um, and it was Ewart. Um, who conducted an extensive series of crossbreeding experiments at his, at his farm in Pennycook near Edinburgh, um, who eventually um, disproved polygony, also with his um, <laughs> offspring, which incredibly were actually known as tartan cudleys, um, or zinnies. Anyway, uh, so perhaps in lieu of a more robust theoretical finding, Walter Heap concluded his 1897 Royal Society paper on a technical um, as well as scientific note, suggesting that his experiments confirmed that, quote, it is possible to make of the uterus of one variety of rabbit a medium for the growth and complete fetal development of fertilized ova of another variety of rabbit. And he suggested, in other words, that the reproductive body can be used experimentally as a kind of apparatus, instrument, or tool. Heap's embryo transfer experiments have become increasingly widely known and highly regarded over the passage of time, and they're now themselves the subject of an increasing amount of literature, including a major monograph by the retired developmental biologist John Biggers. Uh, in part, as a result of the rising importance of IVF, um, the history of embryo transfer has now acquired a slightly higher profile, um, including this article which I've put on this slide with Walter Heap, um, which is a great read if anyone wants to know more about this topic. Um, like many scientists, Heap's legacy is thus technological as much as scientific and inspiring to others because it was his tools and his definition of what a tool could be that opened up new pathways of investigation and have proven to be of lasting scientific value regardless of whether they yielded conclusive scientific results. Francis Hugh Adam Marshall, whose 1910 textbook, um, Reproductive Physiology, is considered to mark the emergence of a new discipline of reproductive biology and draws heavily on Heap's work, um, citing its pivotal importance in linking the study of animal breeding to the experimental study of reproduction. And Marshall, who wrote Heap's obituary in 1930, dedicated his landmark textbook to Heap in recognition not only of his innovative and technically demanding experiments combining the analysis of reproduction and heredity, 
but for his substantial contribution to embryological methods. An important feature of Heap's embryological experiments was not only that they combined an interest in heredity and reproduction and pioneered a new technological means of transferring reproductive substance from one animal to another, but they, they were conducted in mammals. Um, from an embryological point of view, detailed knowledge of the events involved in the very earliest stages of mammalian reproduction and development is much more difficult to obtain in mammals for the simple reason that these events take place inside a living body. Unlike salamanders, frogs, axolotl, chickens, sea urchins, worms, tortoises, fish, or other common model organisms in embryology, the majority of mammals are distinguished by viviparity, the lack of a shelled offspring. Heap's contribution had been to introduce a new tool as well as, an, as new media in the form of other animals um, to prove the viability and to prove the viability of his system for um, experimental purposes. His contribution could be described as the generation of a new species of technique, a technique that has since acquired a life of its own and is now central to two of the world's largest reproductive industries, um, the um, livestock embryo transfer industry and the enormous global reproductive service industry based on clinical IVF, or as it's known in the business, IVF and embryo transfer. However, it's not my intention to either naively celebrate the forward march of scientific discovery over time, obviously, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, nor even the particular genius of Walter Heap, actually, um, much as the conventions of historical narration often tend towards those ends. In fact, I've argued in the chapter of my new book concerning the technological precursors of modern IVF and embryo transfer that they were incredibly haphazard and that Heap's story illustrates just how fortuitous this history was. It turns out many of the stepping stones to IVF were achieved purely by accident, as were gamete cryopreservation and um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection known as ICSI. Um, a lot of the history of IVF is kind of like, oops, you know, <laughs> look. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Um, but this almost random progress from Heap's initial embryo transfers onward is then sutured back together retrospectively. Let's look, um, for example, at the way Heap's experiments are mentioned by JBS or Jack Haldane in his famous paper concerning science in the future, read at Cambridge in 1923. In this paper, Haldane famously predicted that a Cambridge scientist would eventually produce the first IVF offspring in the 1940s. Setting out an imaginary future trajectory um, from the evolution of in vitro fertilization to the eventual routinization of ectogenesis, Haldane's paper narrates a system of direct experimental descent from Walter Heap. Um, as early as 1901, I'm sorry, the, you probably can't read this because that's like terribly lit. Um, as early as 1901, Heap had transferred, I'm reading the quote, transferred er, embryo rabbits from one female to another. In 1925, Haldane had grown embryonic rats in serum for 10 days. Um, in 1946, Clark succeeded with a pig. DuPont and Schwartz obtained a fresh ovary from a woman who was a victim of an airplane accident, etc., etc., etc. And eventually, he gets to the point of. Um, describing um, successful in vitro fertilization. Um, and in turn, this um, article is the origin of some of the key terms that still define discussion in this area today, including both ectogenesis and transhumanism. And um, obviously, these were also the inspiration for um, Brave New World. So moving right along, um, among the other key key aspects of IVF histories is that it paradoxically emerged out of the same research that led to the oral contraceptive pill. Very shortly after Haldane's lecture, Gregory Pincus would arrive at Cambridge, where he too, um, having been inspired by the innovative technicist Walter Heap, begins to experiment with IVF and embryo transfer in mammals. Pincus's work further demonstrates, quote, um, and I'm quoting from the conference description, how understanding focuses on a particular location and is formulated through that location, and more specifically, quote, how understanding is formulated both with and through bodies. Indeed, Pincus explores exactly how these two understandings are related. 
Um, and the outcome of Pincus's work is a kind of atlas of mammalian embryological technique, um, including everything from film and photography to surgical and culture methods. His monograph on the eggs of mammals contains 26 tables, um, 33 figures, and 36 original photographic plates, some of which contain as many as 20 separate photographs each. Heapishly, his work is scientifically inconclusive, but technologically adventurous. Like Heap, he concludes his magnum opus on a technical note, claiming that his work is ded dedicated to, quote, experimental investigation of the growth and development of, ma of mammalian ovum. And here, once again, we see the two biologies, or the three biologies, or however many biologies there are, imploding. We have the egg, the picture of the egg, the picture book of the egg, and the formation of a new disciplinary set of conventions of egg watching, all literally bound together into a germinal text that will shortly inspire Robert Edwards to complete the path towards human IVF. And so, to very briefly summarize, IVF emerges, like embryo transfer, as both a model of um, um, IVF emerges, IVF, which is 1969, initially developed here at Cambridge, eventually transferred into clinical use, 1978, expands hugely quickly after that, yada yada. Um, IVF emerges, like embryo transfer, as both a model of and a model for reproduction, a means of both knowing and doing reproduction, and a transformation of reproduction. And this IVF platform has expanded very, very rapidly um, into genetic diagnosis, into stem cell research, into um, transnational reproductive service industry, and other directions as well. OK, so I just want to move on now to the analysis of this story that I've told you, to the discussion of this story that I've told you about this technique. Because obviously, in the case of mammalian transfer, um, mammalian embryo transfer, we have what sociologists would call a work object, namely something that's being investigated and which we would now, in the newly thingified academy, understand to be speaking back to the investigators with its own agencies and resistances or whatever else we might want to call them, entanglements, becomings, assemblages, interactions, objectologies, whatever. But we can also turn to an earlier hermeneutic, um, that of Donna Haraway's Cyborgs, um, where she describes those, what she calls, ironically imploded techno-natural cultural condensations that are never comprehensible as elsewhere than situated, other than relational, or less than overdetermined. And to understand better the locatedness of working with embryos, let us then turn to Haraway's Cyborgology to understand the materially worlded, historically scripted, enterprised up, and media cultured biology of the living human in vitro embryo, which is where Haraway herself began her own work in Crystals, Fabrics, and Fields, her 1976 book about the history of embryology. Haraway's powerful model of material semiosis, through which technology is interpreted as both expressive and formative of conceptual materiality, which obviously here takes on a set of recursive meanings, draws on her training as both a biologist and a historian and was first forged in the context of embryology. As Haraway noted of the embryological debates described in her 1976 books on the metaphors of organicism that competed to organize 20th century developmental biology, the scientific models that inform experimental biology inevitably also model social life. As she observed in Crystal's Fabrics and Fields, science cannot function without analogies, and these are inevitably also constitutive locations. She says, the traditional mechanist sees similarities between the organism and actual machines, such as the steam engine, hydraulic pump, or a system of levers and pulleys. The neo-mechanist builds a similar similarity set from codes, the molecular basis of genes, language, computers, and the organism. The organicist tends to see similarities in the structure of molecular populations, the cell, the whole organism, and the ecosystem. Concrete analogies are drawn from models, gestalt phenomena, fields, liquid crystals, and also computers. These lists suggest 
the persons holding one of the three perspectives that would be inclined to work on different experimental problems and to interpret the results in a different language. So this is really the recursion whereby conceptuality remakes, literally remakes conception, um, a recursion that has become increasingly familiar and really to a certain extent now defines certain areas of biology. The scene Haraway describes here, described here in the 1970s, let's not forget, of the enframement of experimental action has since come to be known as science in action, laboratory life, sorting things out, and Haraway's concern has always been with the politics of scientific world making. Um, this is exemplified in her first cyborg figure, the cyborg embryo, not yet denominated as such, but just as surely a product of worlds ambiguously natural, natural and crafted, as she calls them, or couplings between organism and machine, such as the chip, the fetus, the gene, the seed, the database, the bomb, the brain, then the ecosystem, um, which are the familiar figures from her work. In writing of the turn of the century embryo, Haraway demonstrated that we cannot even look at the embryo objectively, scientifically, in the laboratory, under a microscope, without seeing it through the lens of prefabricated, culturally inherited, constitutive, real, and inescapable frames of reference that incorporate the external world into what Evelyn Fox Keller describes as the biological gaze. Today, the evolution of IVF and embryo transfer offers similar lessons not only about how socialized and socializing scientific understandings always are, but now also, and ever more visibly, how social values, systems, and aspirations are being engineered and constructed in such a manner that they too become part of what biology and biological mean. Um, I want to um, skip ahead a bit because I want to make sure we have time for discussion, how are we doing for time, yeah. Um, so the question of um, how these understandings are achieved with embryos, for example, by working with embryos, is clearly related to understandings that are formulated through embryos in the sense of using them either as lenses or as specimens. Um, and this question quickly acquires an intriguingly recursive character when we note the number of different forms of passaging through embryos that are occurring in the story I've told you so far. So far, for example, we have the relationship of embryo transfer to the inheritance of scientific concepts and methods. Um, and related to this, we have the theme that I've been emphasizing even more strongly, which is the passaging of technique. So what we have um, might be called technical inheritances that are being passed on over the course of the development of embryology and then literally embodied as offspring. Um, and what's, what's interesting about this history is precisely the relation between with and through, because this is how the processes involved in conception, reproduction, and inheritance are being reconceived, reproduced, and passed along. And the conversion that solidifies this recursive union is achieved as a form of embryo exchange since the conceptus gradually transforms from being the object of study into its means and eventually into its end. Um, so I just want to fill it, finish up um, here um, with the conclusion. So um, it might have been thought um, that the offspring of this union, this union between with and through, um, could only have been an epistemological one. But it turns out to engender a third term as well as offspring, um, which is the expansion I began with, a new kind of situated knowledge, um, a new kind of knowledge about how to use and how to make an embryo into a tool in order to make a man. Um, and it's this final location of knowledge, this final embodiment of the knowledge of embryo transfer that leads us to um, the question I want to end with, um, which I just want to illustrate with um, this incredible brochure that I was sent while I was writing this paper, um, um, which is the new annual report from Cambridge Enterprise. And um, I don't know if you can really see it as clearly 
as you might do if this was slightly better lit, but um, this is the cover of the 2012 annual review. It's just been published, and it's clearly showing um, a cell you know, that's being um, punctured by um, a tool. And if you open up the brochure, you get the other half of this, which is the holding pipette that's holding the cell. Um, and you get a sort of almost like a horizon of this cell being manipulated, which is actually an um, egg cell. Um, and this is um, drawn from a spin-out company from Cambridge that develops genetic diagnosis for in vitro fertilization. And I think what's interesting about this that you can't really quite say so much is that um, this cell, um, this work object, this very interesting um, conceptus, is um, a little bit like an eye. Um, and if you see in the middle, it doesn't really look like a cell. Um, it really looks a little bit more like um, a, way, a way of seeing. Um, so interestingly, and without knowing it, because I talked to the woman who um, designed this pamphlet, um, it, it recapitulates the point I'm trying to make and the question I'm really trying to make, which is, first of all, the role that technology plays in the questions we're asking, and secondly, how this embodiment of with and through has become a way of life, and in particular, a way of human life. So thank you very much. So I want to thank Sarah for that wonderful paper and for what I hope to show is her very important work. And I also want to thank Simon for when he talks about thanking Leverhulme and, and, um, and Mellon, we have to thank him for figuring out how to get and mix Leverhulme and Mellon uh, together. So thank you, Simon. Um, <laughs> But before I start my uh, direct response, um, I just wanted us to, th to think just um, a bit about the extent to which we want to historicize or not the forms of knowledge and understanding that we've been talking about. Because one version of this says, you know, in, a, in an epistemological way, we can know through voice, we can know through things, we can know through concepts. Another version of this, even another version of this conference could be, why are we knowing through things at this particular point? So in regard to, to things, the, the Re-Enlightenment Project has, has worked with um, the ghostwriters of Neil McGregor's 100 Objects, and they made it very clear that their notion of thinking through things was particular to the moment of mass audiences for museums. Because when you have more people tr walking in the doors of the British Museum, and trying to get into the Enlightenment Gallery. In fact, you have to put fewer words on the placards so you can move people faster through it so the lines don't go out to, to Great Russell Street, which means that you have to really do two things. One, engage in the fiction we debated about whether objects speak for themselves. And the other one then is to, is to go to letterpress and produce a, a book and then remediate it into, into shows. In, in regard to the other ways in which, as an example, um, thing theory works, um, it seems to me that here the disciplinary issue is incredibly important. Uh, if you think of who is named, so Jonathan Lamb, uh, uh, Bill Brown, Claire Pettit um, was, was up here, um, it has a lot to do with the fate of literary study. And in many ways, it's an artifact of literary study, which started to feel stuck within the canon then expanded the canon a bit through gender and geography, then expanded more through cultural studies, and then just decided to just do everything as, as well. And the examples, even when it's outside of literary study, uh, canonical texts like uh, Gulliver's Travels, a reference to the lyric as, as the other point that, that Simon emphasized. So it seems to me these are both kind of valid forms of um, engagement. You know, are we talking about a timeless epistemological practice, or are we talking about the specific historical moments in which it makes sense to do this? Uh, and I say that as a preface to the fact that I think the, the, the particular value of what Sarah is doing um, has to do with its historicity. But to understand its historicity, uh, we have to expand um, that history a bit. It is of, quote, considerable sociological interest, Sarah writes, to observe how substantially biology has become technologized, 
As a sociologist of science focusing on IVF, she addresses this process as a modern phenomenon. In fact, I'm sure it was, it was a surprise to some of us to discover that she begins her tale as far back as 1890. But there's a much bigger surprise lurking much further back. When the word technology was first used in English, it was used to make a startlingly similar type of observation. In 1612, we find the following, quote, men void of God's spirit, commonly and promiscuously did dispute of spiritual things and convert theology into technology. 401 years ago, theology was technologized. As a literary historian and the older inclusive meaning of literary as all letters, I can most usefully respond to Sarah's tale by scaling up our history of technologizing. And I can most usefully, use, usefully respond to the rubric of this conference by connecting chronological scale to topographical scale. How, in regard to knowledge, changes over time link to changes in location. The continuity over these four centuries is the concern that something called technology can change the nature of a particular kind of knowledge. The discontinuity is the nature of that change. The complaint in this earlier case is that those men, quote, make no other use of divinity but as a matter of learned or artificial discourse as they talk of other arts and sciences out of humane reason. Clearly, technology signaled something else back then, something that on the basis of this example had to do with kinds of discourse, the practice, that is, of rhetoric. These men had turned theology into a matter of rhetoric rather than reason. That was the complaint. It's tempting to assume that this was just a semantic shift in the meaning of technology. But thanks in particular to Walter Ong, we know that it had much more to do with the subject of this conference. What happened to technology was a change in location. Ong has tracked its journey through Greek and Latin, from Cicero using it to describe his treatment of grammar, to Peter Ramus extending technologia to other arts in the late 16th century. At that time, terms that we now associate with the sciences, invention, for example, as well as technology, were firmly ensconced in the literary domains of grammar and rhetoric. But in the late 16th century, under growing pressure to mount and execute a curriculum for Europe's expanding universities, Ramus played a central role in relocating them within a new organization of knowledge. For Ramos, as Ong emphasized, the chief business of all classification is the classification of the arts and sciences themselves. Such classification is both the starting point of all philosophy and the means of teaching it at a large scale. Seeding this new classification with technology enabled Ramus to play a key role in furthering what Ong famously called the, quote, greatest shift the turn in the face of the rise of letterpress printing from knowledge as the social product of sound and conversation to that which occupies the silent space of a page, the product of an internalized self-referential reason. Technology, I have argued, fit that agenda as a term that even in its etymology embodied that self-referentiality or recursion. It is the speaking of, ology, a techne, that is an art, a method, a system. And system, as the form in which all parts must relate to the whole, became valued as a model for maintaining an internal dialogue. In Kevin Kelly's disarmingly simple description, quote, a system is anything that talks to itself. Technology is the speaking of something that speaks to itself. Let me repeat that. Technology as the speaking of something that speaks to itself thus became an embodiment of a silent and self-sufficient reason. 
Ramus and the Ramus, and the Ramus uh, thus found in technology a particularly useful tool in their curricular efforts, increasingly drawing it and method away from rhetoric or literary composition to the logic of dialectic as the center and core of all philosophy. As that logic materialized in print in the form of elaborate tree diagrams, diagrams that became Ramism's trademark, dialectic became increasingly associated with the quantitative. Logic, that is, was no longer to be enacted in dialogue, but in the measuring out of the world on the page. Just a century after Ramus's murder in 1572, the tree diagrams had branched infinitely into the calculus, the world had become a system in the pages of the Principia, and technology had taken up residence in what became the disciplines of the modern sciences. Invention headed in the same direction once the Ramus severed it from its classical home in rhetoric. Cut free of the social, it came to perform instead the silent work of reason. Diagrams replaced displacing dialogue as the means of discovery. As an increasingly isolated and isolating undertaking, invention like technology also became a feature of what we call the sciences. This is why I think Sarah's work is so important. She is helping to write a new chapter in the history of the organization of knowledge. At the moment in which letterpress printing is loosening its hold on our conceptual architecture, technology is getting its voice back, a process which crucially transpires through a change in location rather than a change in meaning. Technology is being removed, moved in part back to where Ramus had found it, where it was a weapon in the theological strife that claimed Ramus's life. This is what those of us in the Re-Enlightenment Project would call a relocation. To be more precise, without selling its home in the hard sciences and engineering, technology is looking for a good second home in its old noisy haunts. At its best, as in Sarah's work, the sociology of science is a kind of relocation services. A bustling business that has grown from Donna Haraway's startup formed in the early days of Silicon Valley in the 1970s. Sarah provides the most concise and accurate version of its business plan that I have ever read. The sociology of science, she writes, provides a quote, model through which technology is interpreted as both expressive, it talks, and formative of conceptual materiality, unquote. That is, it puts technology back in the place where it can start talking again. What we can then hear is the rhetoric of science, the discourses in the case of IVF that articulate the body as technology, both as, in Sarah's words, a tool and when bodies are put inside bodies per the insertion of one animal's reproductive system in another animal as, quote, media. Sarah's work thus puts in perspective what she amusingly calls, quote, the newly thingified academy. It helps us to answer the obvious question we didn't quite address this morning. Why at the very moment in the early 21st century that digital technology, when digital technologies are taking off and thus proliferating the virtual, have we become newly obsessed with the material and the physical? An obvious answer is that materiality still holds the appeal of the real, outside as well as inside the academy. But there's a less obvious and more, I think, important answer. If Marshall McLuhan resurfaced in the future, as I'm sure he already has, he wouldn't be scratching his head. He'd be explaining thingification with the principle of remediation, the bare bones of which he first uncovered in reading King Lear. I'm modifying it here per Donna and Sarah to describe not just technologies, but also the realities they help to constitute. The principle dictates that in moments of change, the older form of reality becomes the content of the new one. Just as Wordsworth filled the newly physical nature of the Lake District, all of those green things, 
with the metaphysical nostalgia of what he called, quote, something ever more about to be. So we now fill the virtual space of our computers and the web with the remains of the physical. In English, for example, we anatomize in the new book history the materiality of print culture with a further fervor worthy of the television show CSI, a sort of literary scene investigation. From high culture to popular culture, our new programs in universities and on the tube are turning physicality into content. We showcase the real and we watch reality shows. I link the two not to trivialize this transformation, but to emphasize its scope and therefore its long-term importance. In the long revolution of the history of the organization of knowledge, thingifying is and may be most significant, not for its local results, but as a symptom of technology, like embryos, on the move. As those who drive the moving vans that are leading the way, like Sarah, can testify, and the quality of this conference, I think, confirms the location of and perpete the location in knowledge matters. <laughs>